All right, good evening, everyone. Let us, let us begin. So we are continuing in Meretz Hashem tonight in our journey through Safer Tell. I want to begin by thanking our sponsors to thank the Engelsberg, Dinovitzer, and Steinberg families for dedicating this Tehillim series, Le'ilui Nishmas, and the memory of Harav Yitzchak, David, David Ben Meir, Ari Zichron of the We hope that in the merit of our Talmud Torah, the Neshama will have an Aliyah and the families a Nechama. We also thank our sheer sponsors for tonight, Leia Sol, with great appreciation to the entire Kehila. We thank Akiva and Linda Wagshaw for dedicating the sheer tonight, the commemoration of the art site of Akiva's mother, Rus Bas Avram, tonight on the 18th of Tebes. We hope that in the merit of our Talmud Torah, the Neshama will have an Aliyah and the family in Nechama. And with that, let us, let us begin. So we are going to spend one more week in Mir Hashem on Capital Test, Chapter 9. So just a little bit of a, a quick recap from last week, a very, very quick recap. So remember, again, we introduced this Capital Lam Natseach Amos Labain Mizmor LeDavid. So our initial focus was trying to understand who is the Almos and who is the Albain. Remember, is Almos one word, is Almos two words, who is Labain? And we saw a variety of different opinions as to how to understand this particular capital. So remember, again, we went from explanations which spoke about the idea that this capital is actually a reference to the death of Avshalom, the death of Goliath, of Goliath. Then we saw other opinions which seemed to be the more mainstream opinion that Labain was an adversary of David. Who was he? You know, again, we don't know every single adversary of David HaMelech. We just know that there were a lot of them. So therefore, again, Labain was one of David HaMelech's adversaries. And this was a song of triumph and jubilation when David HaMelech overcame this particular enemy. What's exciting about this capital, like we saw about last week, is it's a happy capital. It's a happy chapter. It's nice, it's upbeat, the tone is good, the tone is optimistic. It's Davra Melech in a happy, healthy state in life, not waiting for salvation. You know, so much of Sefer Tehillim is Davra Melech waiting, yearning, and pining for salvation. The beauty of this capital is salvation has already arrived. David HaMelech is celebrating the fact that the Ribbono Shalom has come through for him and has allowed him to meet his particular challenges in life. Tonight, I want to focus on two psukim, and it's the two underlined lines. So, Pasukud and Pasukid Aleph, I'm sorry, David HaMelech writes, V'yi Hashem miskav ladach. So, a very, very beautiful capital. So again, Hashem is the Mizgav Ladach. We'll just use the translation right here. Hashem is the fortress for the crushed, right? Mizgav is a fortress. Dach is one who is, Dach could actually mean impoverished or poor. But in this context, ultimately, again, it's being used as someone who's crushed, someone who's beaten down. The Rebbe Hashem is the fortress for the one who is beaten down. Mizgav Leitos Batsara, a fortress for the times of distress. Then David HaMelech goes on, Literally again, and those who know your name shall trust in you. Those who know your name will have bitachon. We could translate it as trust, as faith in you, kilo azafta darshecha Hashem. For Hashem, you never leave those, you never leave or forsake those who actively seek you out. So let's first look at these psukim independently, and then Amir Hashem see if we can understand them as a more comprehensive total message. So let's begin first with Pasuk Yod. So this idea, Vahi Hashem Miskav Ladach. So you thought it was just the hospital in Yerushalayim, Miskav Ladach, right? But in reality, again, derives its name from this capital in Tehillim. So the fortress, right? The fortress for the crushed, the fortress, the, the fortress for those who are downtrodden. So if you look at the Radak, it's actually quite beautiful. It's really quite beautiful. And by the way, e even, you know, David HaMelech, David HaMelech was such an exceptional poet. 
No one ever referred to HaKadosh Baruch Hu in ways like David HaMelech did. It's an incredible thing to call the Ribbono Shalom the Mizgav Ladach. You are the fortress, right? You are the fortress. You are the bastion of strength for the ones who are crushed, for the ones who are beaten down. What an incredible reference to the Ribbono Shalom. So look what the Radak says, and this is so beautiful. Ve'yashem Mizgav Ladach. So Hashem, you are a fortress for those who are, who are crushed, beaten down. You are a fortress for times of distress. Look what the Radak writes, number two. Whenever HaKadosh Baruch Hu has to judge the world, He's always the fortress for the impoverished individual. Meaning what? Or in other words, the Rebona Shal Olam always roots for the underdog. In other words, sometimes in life there's always an underdog, right? In life there's always someone who's disadvantaged. Just know that the Rebona Shal Olam looks out for everyone, but he especially looks out for those who are the Dach, for those who are beaten down, for those who have been crushed sometimes by the burdens of life. The truth is, this is not David Amalek's idea. We see this already in the Chumash where the Chumash goes out of its way to tell us something amazing. The Torah says, you're not allowed to mistreat or to afflict the widow or the orphan, which is a very strange thing to say. Why is it a strange thing to say? You're not allowed to afflict or mistreat who? Anyone, right? In other words, isn't there, oh, okay, the widow and the orphan, be very careful. Everyone else I'll mistreat, but not widows and orphans. In other words, you're not allowed to mistreat anyone. So, the, the, so there's two things. First of all, it's human nature to take advantage of people. And this is, it sounds like a very jaded, cynical statement, but it's the truth, right? People take advantage of people, and people more often take advantage of people who they feel they could take advantage of. So essentially from a biblical perspective, the widow and the orphan might be without someone to advocate for them, might be without someone to actively care for them, might be without someone to look after them. And therefore, our Kodesh Baruch Hu says, don't take advantage of them. Not only that, but in a general sense, the Ribbono Shal Olam always has a special place in his heart for the brokenhearted. And this is, this is the thing that David HaMalach is saying. Those who often the rest of the world takes advantage of, those who often the rest of the world perceive as weak or vulnerable, HaKadosh Baruch who tells us, tells them, I'm here for you. I'm here for you. Look at these words. There are people in this world who are downtrodden. And there are people in this world who are powerless, without connections, without abilities. HaKadosh Baruch Hu does not allow us to be swallowed up by those who are stronger than us. So understand, of course, see, here's what's amazing. And this is part of, you know, um, part of the, one of the most, the Ribbon Shalom is incredible. I think we'll all agree on that, right? The Ribbon is exceptional. One of the most incredible things about HaKadosh Baruch Hu is the fact that he is timeless. Haya, hove, v'yihiyah. Past, present, future, and simultaneously. Simultaneously, you know, it struck me. I remember last year, Pesach, not, not last, two years ago. When was the first Pesach of the pandemic? Before. Feels like the pandemic's been about 20 years now, right? So, so whatever it was, like the first Pesach, you know, that, that, that first Pesach, when er, like literally everything was shut down. Everything was shut down. So I remember, again, we had a Seder. We had a Seder. Um, you know, my, my married daughter was not with us. My boys were, were, were quarantined in yeshiva. So they were... Uh, who was quarantined? They were quarantined Sukkis. Sukkis. Okay, good. I'm stopping my wife comes to share, by the way. Otherwise, what, what would I do? Uh, all right, good. So in any event, whoever was home was home. Point, point being, point being... That, you know, I always tell my children and my family, it's a big thing. But we always say, before we open the door for Eliyahu HaNavi, before we open the door, you have to believe with all of your heart that Eliyahu HaNavi could be on the other side. You can't open the door unless you believe that. Because if you don't believe that, then what are you doing? And so we always pause for a little bit, sing a little bit by the closed door, just getting ready for Eliyahu HaNavi. And if he's there, fantastic. And if he's not there... We'll dry our tears and we'll move on and we'll just wait for tomorrow, Mir Hashem. And I remember going outside and of course, Pesach, Pesach, what does the moon look like on Pesach? What does it look like? It's a full moon. Remember again, it's not by accident that HaKadosh Baruch Hu took us out in the middle of the month. He purposely did that. Because again, that way when leaving Egypt, there, you know, 
we're so reliant, we, we focus on artificial, you know, luminescence. So for us, the moon's whole, the moon's half, doesn't really make a big difference. But again, he purposely took us out middle of the month. And I said to my children, remember that that moon that you're looking at, that's the same moon that our ancestors thousands of years ago saw when they left Mitzrayim. It's the same moon. It's the same light. Because HaKadosh Baruch Hu, the Ribbon Shalom, is Haya Hove V'yiyya. Rabbi Salavechik Zechitzadik says something amazing. He says, everything that HaKadosh Baruch Hu possesses, every trait, a Jew possesses some similarity of that trait as well. So Rabbi Salavechik has a term, he calls it the unitive time consciousness. Unitive time consciousness. Unitive time consciousness means that we also have the ability to live in past, present, and future simultaneously. And we all have moments like that. Moments where you feel like you are experiencing everything at once. I feel the enormity of that which has come before me. I feel the awesome responsibility that I have in front of me. And I picture the future that I am building towards, unitive time consciousness. Why am I sharing this with you? Because part of the power of Sefer Tilim also is that David HaMelech writes in HaYehovah V'yiyah, whether he intended it this way or this is the Mepharshim understand it, every single one of David HaMelech's kapitlach could be understood as referring to the past, Kali Yisrael's past, could be understood as referring to David HaMelech's present, or could be understood as referring to Kali Yisrael's future. And they're all correct. So when the Radak says, that David HaMelech says, Miskav Ladach, Hashem is the fortress for the oppressed. The Radak says, David HaMelech is saying, no matter how beaten, battered you are, HaKadosh Baruch Hu will never let you get swallowed up. Who is he talking to? Who is he talking to? So the answer is, who is he talking to? Everyone, right? He's talking to himself because how many times in life was David HaMelech beaten down? How many times in life... To more than we even know, because we only know the recorded instances. But I guarantee you, for every recorded instance, there's 10 others that are unrecorded. So is it David HaMelech? Is it the past of Klal Yisrael? Is it the future of Klal Yisrael? And the answer is everything. But what a profound message al tells us. Chalish Baruch Hu is the fortress. He is the Miskav Ladach. And here's the amazing part. Even when the rest of the world forgets about you, right? And you know, we all have moments like that where we feel totally forgotten and forsaken. By the way, even David HaMelech had moments like that, and he gives that expression in Sefer Tillim. David HaMelech says some of the most heartbreaking, one of the most heartbreaking phrases, Ki avi vi'imi azavuni v'hashem ya'asveni. My mother and my father, they left me. And the Mepharsh what do you mean your mother and your father, they left you? David HaMelech says, they died. They died. Parents love a child. But isn't it amazing that no matter how much parents love a child, at some point in time, parents leave their children. And David HaMelech says, all of life's relationships could come and go. right? And sometimes I feel forsaken. Sometimes I feel alone. Sometimes I feel marginalized. Sometimes I feel beaten and battered. In those moments when you feel all alone, just always know, HaKadosh Baruch Hu is always there. The devotion is always there. And that's the Mizgav Ladach, says the Radak. Even when you feel cast aside, maybe by others in life, maybe when you feel cast aside, maybe by society, maybe you feel cast aside by your family, maybe you feel cast aside in any life relationship, just know HaKadosh Baruch Hu is there. And HaKadosh Baruch Hu never casts you aside. HaKadosh Baruch Hu never forgets. He says, Elohu lo lemiskav. HaKadosh Baruch Hu is my fortress. V'yiskav ha'ani bo kimo she'yisagiv adam b'migdal oz. U kimo she'niskavu bo Yisrael hayom Olam is our fortress. He is the fortress of Klal Yisrael as a nation, and he is the fortress of Klal Yisrael as individuals as well. Now here's what's interesting. You see, you don't really need a fortress when times are good, right? When do you need a fortress? When do you need a fortress? This is the second part of the Pasuk. Miskav li'itos batsara. I need a fortress when times are bad. And that's right, when times are good, I'm fine. I, I got this, right? But when there are tsaras, that's when I need the Ribbono Shal Olam Fortress. And the Radak concludes, Ki Yisrael ata b'tsara gidolo mipnei zeh plishti u plishtim shayu miskar malayim. So that remember again, the Radak's position 
was that Amos Labain was referring to Goliath, was referring to Goliath. So therefore, David HaMelech is talking about over here, Klal so you know, you know the story from Navi, Klal Yisrael was petrified of Goliath, right? He was terrorizing them each and every day, and they felt there was absolutely no recourse. So the Radak refers it to that specific episode, but the truth is not tied to that episode. It's David HaMelech, whoever David HaMelech is talking to, himself, the past, the present, the future, just recognize that in those moments when you feel alone, and we all have moments like that, HaKadosh Baruch Hu is the fortress for those who are broken and for those who are beaten down. The Mitzudas David says the same idea in number three, so beautiful, Miskav Ladach L'Nishbere Leiv, to the brokenhearted, to the brokenhearted. Right? Whoever has heartbreak in life, Yeh L'Miskav Umasayem L'Miskav Kishia Ba'olam Eis Tzara. So the Mitzudas David says, where do you turn to when your heart is broken? Right? You know, because often we'd want to turn to loved ones when our heart is broken. But the great difficulty in life is that sometimes it's my very loved ones who break my heart. So what, what, do, I, what do I do in those ones? Who do I turn to? The Mizgav Ladach. I turn to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Because the Yibam is always my fortress. He's always there for me. And he's always present to mend the broken heart. Now that's the first part. Okay, so David HaMalach, therefore again... Whether, and I just want to point out, this is the enormity of the Haya Hove Viyiyah. You could plug this in to Klal Yisrael's past, David HaMelech's present, Klal Yisrael's future, whatever you want to. But the, the Yisod is the same, which is there are times when we are brokenhearted. There are times when we are dach, battered and broken. In those moments, HaKadosh Baruch Hu is my fortress. Second Pasuk, going to go back up for a moment to number, to number one. Pasuk Yedala, verse 11. Then what did we say? So literally again, they will trust in you or those who know your name. Those who are Yodei Shemecha, know your name, will trust in you, Hashem, for you have not forsaken those who seek you out. What's the connection between these two psukim? So the Ebenezer Ezra number four writes very simply, the Yiftuchu Becha, Kasher Yiru, so it's interesting. The way the Ebenezer reads these psukim is almost like as a cause and effect. So what's the cause? The cause is there are going to be times in life where I am broken and battered. Times in life when I am a dach. I am a dach. I'm beaten down. And in those moments, I will find refuge in my creator. I will find a fortress in HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And as a result of HaKadosh Baruch Hu taking me in, and nourishing me, and loving me, and keeping me close in times of difficulty, the result of that is what? V'yiftuchu becha. The result of that is bitachon. So the bitachon, the belief, or the trust in HaKadosh Baruch Hu, is the result of feeling that HaKadosh Baruch Hu was there for me in times of distress. So it's a very interesting way to read the psukim, a cause and effect. When I'm downtrodden, when I'm downtrodden and everyone else leaves me, no one is in my corner in life. Miss Gavladach, you are my fortress. You are my fortress. And by the way, we experience that in different ways in life. Sometimes I've experienced an incredible, a person experiences an incredible crisis and no one's there to help. And it happens. It happens that there are crises in life and no one is there to help. But somehow I find the strength and I find the courage to meet that challenge. Where did that strength and courage come from? Where did that come from? That came from HaKadosh Baruch Hu. I mean, it came from within me, but who put it in there? Who put it in? That's the Ribbon Sha'olam. That's the Mizgav Ladach. That's the fortress. And as a result of realizing that Hashem comes through for me in times of difficulty, V'yiftuchu b'cha yodei shemecha. I become a yodeya. I became someone who knows HaKadosh Baruch Hu, and therefore I believe in Him. But the truth is, you can read the Psukim in a little bit of a, of a different way as well. And perhaps, perhaps, it's how does HaKadosh Baruch Hu become the Misgav Ladach? In other words, that like, that like how, how, how do you, I, I want this, right? I want HaKadosh Baruch Hu to be my fortress. I want to have that in life. I, I really do. Who doesn't want that in life? Because all of us who have been around the block, you know, one or a hundred times, right? Know that even in the best relationships, you can't always count on people to be there. So David HaMelech is saying is, but you can always count on God. You can always count on HaKadosh Baruch Hu. He's the fortress. He's the rock. He's always there. So how do I access that? 
I, I, I want that. Who doesn't want that? I want that stable relationship that, that anchors me in times of difficulty. So how do I get it? How do I get, how do I access the Hashem, who's the Mizgav Ladach? Perhaps the way to access that is the Yiftichu Bicha Yodei Shemecha. I work on my Bitachon. I work on my, we translate Bitachon in different ways. Bitachon literally means security right, or trust, right, but we often translate it as belief. We use bitachon and amuna kind of synonymously, even though they're not really the same concepts, not our topic for tonight, but bitachon and amuna are really somewhat different things. Bitachon, right, and, well, all right, fine, I'll talk about it, right, just for a second, right, very, very quickly, right, amuna just means a belief. Bitachon means a belief in the security of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Bitachon is the concept, like bitachon, bitachon means security. I believe that HaKadosh Baruch Hu has my back. You see, Amuna means a lot of things. Amuna means, I believe God is the creator, right? Like the Rabbam has, Yid Gimel Ikarim of Amuna, 13 principles of faith, right? Those are different things that I believe in. So Amuna are the articles of belief. Bitachon is a sense of security in my relationship with Hashem. That I believe Hashem has my back. I believe that he is going to take care of me. When I face crisis, when I face difficulty, it doesn't mean that I'm not worried. I'm worried. Of course I'm worried. I'm Jewish. I'm worried. But at the end of the day, I feel confident. I have bitachon. I feel secure. I feel secure because I know that HaKadosh Baruch Hu has got this. So perhaps, perhaps, what David HaMelech is saying is like this. How does HaKadosh Baruch Hu become your fortress in times of need? Well, in order to believe, or in order for HaKadosh Baruch Hu to have, to become your fortress, one has to work first on their bitachon. You see, the great anomaly of our relationship with Hashem is people often think that people find God in times of crisis. I will tell you, I have found that to be the exact opposite. In times of crisis, people often have to use all of their energy and all of like their koach to keep their head above water, to keep their head above water. They don't have time often for God and they don't have time for spirituality. Their focus is often on just like, how do I get through the day? How do, right? If you ever know, I, 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 I'm talking here about like, the big crises, I have, you know, big crisis, big crisis is relative. But I'm talking about things that like we encounter these situations that are all consuming. And the truth is sometimes all of my koach goes through just getting through the day. There's no time for God. There's no time for, it's, it's, that's just not right now. What we sometimes forget is the time to build bitachon is actually in times of serenity and tranquility. You know, like the three minutes of serenity and tranquility that you have, right? The, the, in those moments, that's when you, you don't build bitachon in crisis. In crisis, you're in crisis mode. Crisis mode is usually survival mode. Survival mode does not lend itself to deep con to theological contemplation and forging a meaningful and deep relationship with HaKadosh Baruch Hu. It usually focuses on survival. When there's not a crisis, that's when you build your bitachon. That's when you reinforce in your idea, Hashem has my back. And let me look at some examples in my life where Hashem has had my back. Right? And in times of serenity and tranquility, you could take a panoramic look at your life. You could say, wow, how could the Shabbat had my back over here? Oh, I almost made that mistake over here. The Shabbat kept me from that. And then you can begin to see, you build your bitachon. You build your bitachon. So perhaps what David HaMelech is saying is, so it's interesting. So the Eben Ezra understands the Psukim as a cause and effect. How does Hashem, or I should say, ultimately again, Kadosh Baruch Hu is my Mizgav Ladach, he's my fortress when I am beaten down. And as a result of that, V'yiftichu Becha, I cultivate Bitachon. Just suggesting that perhaps it can be understood in the reverse as well. That how does a Kadosh Baruch Hu become my fortress when I'm beaten down? If I've worked hard to create a sense of Bitachon prior to the crisis. If I work on my Bitachon, in times of serenity and calm in life, then when the storm comes, which inevitably it will for each of us, I'm ready. My fortress is intact, my relationship with Hashem is solid, and I know 
that I could rely on him. But the truth is, I want to share with you perhaps one other insight into this idea based on a fascinating episode in the parasha. If you take a look at number five. So this, I think, is perhaps one of the strangest stories in the entire Chumash that happens to be in this week's parasha. The great Schos this week to begin Chumash Shmos. So this is Chumash Parsha Shmos. Torah says, Vahi baderach bamalon. So let me give you the context. The context is Moshe Rabbeinu was conscripted into the service of God. And I say conscripted because Moshe Rabbeinu, like almost all of our great leaders, did not choose this destiny. Right? Destiny chose him. He did not choose it. Moshe Rabbeinu, just like David Amalek. Right? What are Moshe Rabbeinu's great aspirations in life? Great aspirations? Shepherd. Everybody wants to be a shepherd, right? That's it. They just want to be left alone, tend their sheep, raise a family, lead a normal life. That's it. That's what Avram Avinu wanted. That's what David Amalek wanted. That's what Moshe Rabinu wanted. That's what Esther Amalka wanted. Not with the sheep, but just to be left alone and just be an ordinary person. Great people, and it's, this is the story of our people, great people don't usually go out looking for destiny. Great people, destiny finds them, they find the courage to rise to the occasion, right? That, that, that's what makes great people great. They find the courage to kind of put their own aspirations to the side and answer the call of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. So therefore, again, that's the context over here. So Moshe Rabbeinu has been conscripted by God at the burning bush, all back and forth, like, I'm going, I'm not going, I'm going. Finally, he's going, he's gonna be the leader. So now he has Sipora, Sipora and his two sons, Gershom and Eliezer, right? Eliezer was just born, right? And now they're on the way down to Mitzrayim. Now, remember again, you'll say to yourself, Zipporah and the boys came down to Mitzrayim. That doesn't mean, we don't, we, that doesn't sound like that. We never hear about them. Next, remember again, this is the last time we hear about Zipporah and the boys. The next time we hear about Zipporah and the boys is when? Is when? Parshas Yisro, right? When Yisro, the Torah tells us, is bringing back Zipporah and the boys. Well, what happened? There weren't they with Moshe? Rashi quotes something amazing. Rashi quotes it as Moshe Rabbeinu is coming down to Mitzrayim. He sees Aaron. He sees his brother. And Aaron says, who, who are these people? Moshe says, oh, this is my wife, my children, Mazel Tov, wonderful. Aaron says, where, where are you taking them? Oh, we're coming down to Egypt. To which Aaron says, Moshe, you didn't even get the memo. We're taking people out of Egypt, right? The goal is to get people out of Egypt, not to bring new people to Egypt. And therefore Moshe sends Sipporah and the boys back to Midian, back to Yisro. So Tzipora and Moshe Rabbeinu's sons, Gershon and are not there. They're not part of Kalal Yisrael for this, the entire Exodus narrative. They joined Kalal Yisrael at some later time. And even there's a Machlokas, when they joined up with their father, husband, with the Kalal, was it after the war with Amalek? Was it after they came out of Yamsuf? Was it after Matan Torah? A big Machlokas. The, the whole, we'll, we'll come to that story in future Shi'urim. In any event, so Moshe Rabbeinu now is down, he's going down to Mitzrayim, with Tzipora and his sons. Now he was on his way in an inn. In an inn. They were, they were, they were, they were um, securing lodging on the way down to Egypt. Hashem met Moshe. And he's ready to kill him. Ready to kill him. So Tzipor takes a sharpened rock. She gives a brismila to her baby, to her son, to, to Eliezer. She throws the foreskin, the arla, at his feet. Sounds like at Moshe Rabbeinu's feet. And she says, Ki chasan damim atali, For you are a bridegroom of blood to me. Mimenu. So he, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, released Moshe. As Amra, chasan damim lamulos. She said to him, a bridegroom of blood concerning the circumcision. Strange story. Strange. And by the way, this is not like a medrash. These are psukim in the Torah. This is this week's parasha, a most dramatically strange story. What is going on over here? So here's what we know. Here's what we know. All right, number one, what do we know? What do we know? HaKadosh Baruch was angry at Moshe Rabbeinu. Right, that we know. How do we know that? He's ready to kill Moshe which is very strange, considering the fact that this the, the Akash Baruch Hu just spent all of this time convincing Moshe Rabbeinu to assume the mantle of leadership. But now, he stands ready to kill Moshe. Okay, that's number one that we know. Number two, clearly, this whole thing has something to do with bris milah. Right? 
And the Pashtus, and the, on a basic level, it has to do with their youngest child's bris milah. Eliezer's bris milah. Okay, number three, Tzipo, excuse me, Tzipora gives the baby a bris milah, and Moshe Rabbeinu is saved from the clutches of death. Okay, so what's happening over here? Well, what's the infraction? What did Moshe Rabbeinu do wrong? Why is HaKadosh Baruch Hu all upset? upset? So if you take a look at the Rashbam, so the Rashbam says in number six, Vayib Kasheu Hashem, Ki haya mis'atza bahalichasu umodich ishta ubanav. So the Rashbam says, no, throw in the language Why is God upset with Moshe? Why is he upset with Moshe? Because Moshe, you should have understood that there is an urgency to this mission. And therefore, you don't start packing up the biblical minivan when you have to go ahead and redeem the people. This is not a family outing, right? Can you imagine you start packing snacks? Where's the bathroom? Where's this? You forgot the juice boxes, right? This, Moshe, this is not, this is not a trip, not a Cholomite trip over here, right? This is, you have to get down to Egypt to redeem the people. The family does not come with on this one. So according to the Rashbam, HaKadosh Baruch Hu is angry at Moshe because he feels that Moshe does not understand the urgency of the why of the task, why are you bringing your family? If you look at the words of Hashem, they're very strong. <laughs> Moshe Benu was lax, was lax. Mis atzel, atzel literally means what? Literally means what? Lazy, right? He felt that Moshe Benu took a lazy, lackadaisical approach to the execution of the mission. <laughs> and he's bringing his wife and his kids. This is not a trip for the wife and the kids. Get it together, get down to Egypt, get the people out. The fact that you're not going with an urgency indicates that you don't understand the importance of your mission. And the truth is, the, the, the severity of the plight of Klal Yisrael. Dicheskuni, same idea. Moshe Rabbeinu should have gone on his own and should have made haste, should have gone quickly to execute the mission of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. halach la'at l'regel ishto u'banav shaholich imo. So again, once again, Sidra Shram de Chizkuni and many other Mepharshim understanding that HaKadosh Baruch Hu is upset with Moshe because he feels that Moshe Rabbeinu did not execute this shlichus, did not execute this agency with the proper haste, alacrity, and urgency. Here's the problem with the approach of the Rashbam de Chizkuni. What's the problem? What's the problem with their approaches? What doesn't it address? The bris. In other words, if that's the case, if that's the case, why are you bringing up the whole bris milah in here? Right? What, what, what does that have to do with the narrative? And in fact, by the way, not only that, remember again, who saves Moshe in his life in this story? Sipora. Right? So I, I don't say if this is just about Moshe Rabbeinu not going with enough haste. Why, why this circumcision narrative? What does that have to do with anything? So it comes on the Gemara Masech Zedram number eight and gives a dramatically different interpretation to the story. Tanya, Yeshua ben Karcha, Yeshua ben Karcha says, Gedola Mila, you see how important the mitzvah of bris mila is. Shekol zechuyos sha'asa Moshe Rabbeinu, lo amdalo kishen esrashel min hamila. Ultimately, again, you see how important bris mila is? Because when Moshe Rabbeinu was derelict in his responsibility, to give his son a bris milah, all of his accrued merit did not help to save him from the wrath of God. So you see something already. So Yeshua ben Karcha is introducing to the idea, HaKadosh Baruch Hu is upset with Moshe Rabbeinu. Why? Because he was derelict in the mitzvah of giving his son Eliezer a bris milah. Amar Rebbe. Rebbe says, Chas v'shalom she Moshe Rabbeinu that Moshe Rabbeinu would have been derelict in circumcising his son. First, you have to understand something. Mila, right? Bris Mila, circumcision, is one of the things that the Jewish people kept during their time in Egypt. Right? This, this was a defining mark of Klal Yisrael. So to think that Moshe Rabbeinu would have been derelict in circumcising his son, Rabbi says, that's crazy. Okay, so what happened? Watch this. Ela Amar, here was the problem. Moshe Rabbeinu said as follows. Ela Amar. So this is interesting. Amar is giving us a little bit of a window into Moshe Rabbeinu's internal back and forth. And he said, Amol ve'ed, say sakani. So now the Gemara gives us a new story. Mazel Tov, Eliezer is born. Eliezer is born, right? And at the same time Eliezer is born, Chosh Baruch tells Moshe, 
You're the new leader of the Jewish people. Get down to Egypt. So now Moshe Rabbeinu has a quandary. What's the problem? I have to circumcise my son. Now remember again, Moshe Rabbeinu still assumes that his family is coming with him. So what's the problem? What should I do about the circumcision? If I circumcise Eliezer now, you can't travel with a newly circumcised child, right? You have to allow the baby to rest, allow the baby to recuperate. So if I circumcise the baby now, Moshe says, then ultimately, again, I won't be able to go out and go down to Egypt now. I'll be delayed in going down to Egypt, okay? If I circumcise the baby now, and what? And what? And then wait three days, because that's the amount of time you give a baby post-circumcision to heal, then what? I'm in violation of God's work, because what did God tell me to do? What did God tell me to do? God told me to go. God told me to go now. So what should I do? Right? So in other words, so Moshe you know, has this quandary. If I go ahead and I, if, if I go ahead and I do the Mila now, I'm going to be delayed in going. If I don't do the Mila now, then I'm delaying the Bris Mila. So what should I do? So here, so what, what did Moshe Rabbeinu decide? So here's what's interesting. Here's what Moshe Rabbeinu, Moshe Rabbeinu decided, let me start the journey. Let me get started with the journey. And what I'll do is I'll give the bris milah on the way. So the journey in totality will take longer. It'll take longer, but at least I've started the journey. We see what Moshe Rabbeinu felt would have been inappropriate is to give the baby a bris in midyan and then be totally delayed from beginning the, from beginning the journey. Let me start the journey. Give the bris sometime in the middle of the journey. Okay, we'll have to rest for a couple of days. And then we'll continue, but at least the journey has started. By the way, so, sounds like a pretty good solution to the problem. So why was Moshe Rabbeinu punished? This is fascinating. Why? Because Moshe Rabbeinu went ahead and dealt with the hotel arrangements first. Shene Amar. So ultimately, the Gemara says something absolutely amazing. So the Gemara says, Moshe Rabbeinu made the right call. The call was begin the journey, circumcise the baby en route, even though it's going to delay the journey, right? It's going to, I shouldn't say delay, it's going to prolong the journey. So great. What was Moshe Rabbeinu's mistake? He checked into the hotel before he did the bris milah. Should have done the Mila first. As soon as you stop, okay, we're going to stay here for a little bit. Do bris Mila, then take care of accommodations afterwards. But Moshe Rabbeinu took care of accommodations first and then did the Mila. Wrong order. And therefore, Akadosh Baruch gets And that's the Pasuk. Vayhi baderech bamalon vayifkesheyo Hashem akesh amiso. Moshe Rabbeinu checked into the hotel. You checked into the hotel, right? That's what you're doing first. Akadosh Baruch was furious ready to kill Moshe Rabbeinu. Okay, seems a bit over the top, right? Seems a bit extreme, right? I, I understand, I understand. Moshe should have, should have dealt, dealt with the Mila first before the hotel. He's traveling with kids. He's traveling with kids, traveling with a wife, wants to get the family settled. It doesn't seem such an egregious thing to check into the hotel. Okay, if you were to tell me that he's handling to get an upgrade, you know, that's why Kashmir gets upset. Fine, but he's checking into the hotel. Like, it, it doesn't sound like anything so terrible. So what is it that's unfolding over here? So take a look. So take a look at number 10. So Rav Avram Yitzchak HaKoyen Kuk, Zechir Tzadeh V'Kadosh Levrach, and his Sefer Orech Mishpat, says something absolutely amazing. Because obviously there, there's something deeper unfolding over here. Right? First of all, you have to understand something. Let's say Moshe was wrong. Let's say he was wrong, right? And let's say at the end of the day, at the end of the day, he should have dealt with the Mila first before checking into the hotel. Fine, let, let, let's accept that premise. Does the divine response to Moshe Rabbeinu's mistakes seem proportionate? No, not at all. Not at all. Which tells us there has to be something deeper unfolding over here. So look what Rav Kook writes, and this is absolutely beautiful. Number 10, Rav Kook says, Chassan Damim, so, right, quotes over here, the Gemara, that says, Moshe Rabbeinu, his mistake was that he dealt with the hotel accommodations before doing the bris milah. Are you talking? Chef Cook says, is that possible? This is Moshe Rabbeinu. 
This is Moshe Rabbeinu. Look, come be Yisrael ki Moshe. Oh, this is Moshe Rabbeinu. Moshe Rabbeinu, you know what the greatness of Moshe Rabbeinu was more than anything? He was able to intuit the will of God. Right? You know, the, the, the Ramchal, Ramosh Chaim Lutzatu, and Mesil Sisharim, speaks about Chasidus. And he says, what does it mean to be a Chasid? What does it mean to be a Chasid, to be a truly pious individual? The Ramchal says the definition of a Chasid is someone who is able to intuit the will of God. That I know what HaKadosh Baruch Hu wants. The Ramchal explains so beautifully, mitzvos are not an ends, they're a means. Mitzvos is the way that HaKadosh Baruch Hu tells us what's important to him and what's good in this world. What's my job? My job is to say, okay, now I know what's important to God. Let me build on that. That's what a chassid does. A chassid is able to intuit the Ratzin Hashem. Moshe Rabbeinu, his, his whole essence was the ability to intuit the word of God. So Rav Kook says, Moshe Rabbeinu didn't understand that it wasn't better to take care of the Mila before checking into the hotel. Listen to what Rav Kook says. Amnam. Hidr mitzvah lasos suda be'es hamila. Why was Moshe Rabbeinu checking into the hotel first? Why was he checking into the hotel? It wasn't because he wanted to take a nap and a shower before the bris mila. It's because he recognized that mila is a beautiful mitzvah. And when it comes to mitzvahs, there's a concept of hidr mitzvah. Beautification of a mitzvah, right? You could light Shabbos candles in anything, right? You could take a glass, you could put some wick in you know, oil and it's good. But Hidr Mitzvah says, get beautiful leichter, right? You could pick any little of an esrug, but you should pick something beautiful. You can make any sukkah. Zek and we beautify mitzvahs. That is the goal. That when I do a mitzvah, I beautify it. Says Ruf Kook, something absolutely amazing. Why did Moshe Rabbeinu take care of the lodging before doing the bris milah? The logic, because Moshe Rabbeinu wanted to do the bris in a bakavadic way. He wanted there to be a su'uda, an omelet station, of course. Right? He wanted there to be, should be something nice. It should be something beautiful, not by the side of the road. That way we're going to pull into the shoulder, do the bris milah, and then rest for a couple of days in the hotel. No, let's go. Let's make a su'uda. Let's make a kiddush Hashem. Let's invite the local people. Introduce and spread the word in the name of God to other people who may not know. Let's, let's publicize this mitzvah. That was Moshe Rabbeinu's kavana. Chashav, and therefore, based on that, Chashav tov la'acher velasos behider. Moshe Rabbeinu said to himself, you know what? He made a calculation. Better to delay doing the mitzvah till later if I could do it better. Better to delay if I could do it better later. Right? Better to delay if I could do it better later. That was his, that, that was his cheshpan. That, that, that's what he thought. And what happened? The Eshafar says, as Sarah Kuk goes on and he says, HaKadosh Baruch Hu says to Moshe, you're wrong. You're wrong. Don't delay the opportunities in life even if they are imperfect. You see, Moshe Rabbeinu made a calculated decision. I could do bris mila now, uh, but it's just going to be okay. right? Or it's going to be with no fanfare. Or it's going to be without all the beauty. Or I could delay it and do it in an even more beautiful way. So Moshe Rabbeinu decides it is better to delay the opportunity if that delay allows me to do it in a more beautiful fashion. And the Kaddish Baruch Hu says to Moshe, you're wrong. You're not just wrong. You're dead wrong. You're dead wrong. Because never get into the habit of delaying opportunities because you think that they will be better later on. Because those who get into the habit of delaying opportunities until later, what happens? Often the opportunities are not there. Or ultimately, again, people just simply forget and move on. Better to do something now in a more low-profile way, even with less hider, than to wait until later and potentially do it better. That's the, says Rav Kook, and it's so profound. Says Rav Kook, that's the, that's the conflict over here. And why does HaKadosh Baruch Hu deal so harshly with Moshe Rabbeinu? Because remember, HaKadosh Baruch Hu also knew everything that Moshe Rabbeinu does is looked at under a microscope and is there to model for us, for all future generations, what the right mode of behavior is. So if Moshe Rabbeinu would have first checked into the hotel, then done the bris milah, what's the takeaway? What's the takeaway message? What's the takeaway message? Takeaway message is, it's okay to wait. It's okay to wait. 
there's an opportunity to do a mitzvah, there's an opportunity to do something good. Aye, but if you wait, you can maybe do it better. Wait, wait, wait. HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, no. No, that is a deadly mindset. Because those who delay the opportunities of life, those who don't seize the opportunities of life under the guise that if I wait until later, it will be better, more often than not lose out on the incredible opportunities in life. Or in other words, what HaKadosh Baruch Hu was teaching Moshe Rabbeinu was do not wait for the perfect moment, but make the present moment perfect. And that becomes the mantra of the Jew. Do not wait for the perfect moment, make the present moment perfect. Now, when you make the present moment perfect, is it gonna be perfect? No, because remember, where are they going to do the bris? By the way, and look how this bris unfolds, by the way, right? This was not a bris for the ages, right? This, this was not, Bakshan, the videographer, was not there, right? This is not a Pasha bris. Moshe Rabbeinu is being swallowed up by HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Sipporah is doing this bris mila with a sharpened stone, one, two, three, right? It, crazy, craziness, isn't it incredible? Moshe Rabbeinu has this whole grand plan about how beautiful this is going to be. HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, no, that, that's, that's not what we do. That's not what we do. That's not how we live. We don't wait for the perfect moment. We make the present moment perfect. Recognizing that making the present moment perfect is often laden with imperfections. But ultimately, when the opportunities in life come your way, do not delay. Because so often again, we say, oh, later will be better. Or I'll do it better then. Or if I get to it then. And so often in life, how many of us have missed out on so many opportunities? Just simply because... We have not seized them when they came our way. And again, no one likes to say, I don't seize opportunities. So we come up with all kinds of things. It's not the right time. It's not the right moment. I could do it better then. Like Moshe Rabbeinu. Sometimes those legitimate things, we really mean it. Moshe Rabbeinu also had an incredibly good cheshbon. Let me get in. Let me check in. Let me make a suit. Let me get the kid or let me make it nice. Hidr mitzvah. Kodesh Baruch Hu says, no. Opportunities in life present themselves. Don't wake. Make the present moment perfect. And I'll show you something interesting about this because the truth is this idea of maximizing the imperfections of life really is already present from the beginning of creation. So if you look at number 11, so this is a, 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 a very important yisod. We've spoken about this many times in different contexts over the years. Torah says, well, back to Bereshus. Vayomer Elohim. So this is back in the Genesis narrative. Vayomer Elohim. Tatshe Eretz Desha. Esav Mazriya Zera. Eitz pri ose pri limino, asher zar o bo ala aretz vayichain. Kadesh Baruch Hu said, literally again, let the earth, let the earth sprout forth vegetation. Eitz pri ose pri. Right? So remember again, how do you translate that phrase? Eitz pri ose pri. Fruit trees, which produce, excuse me, which produce fruit. Which produce fruit. Rashi explains that what was the original goal of creation. Right? Rashi number 12. Right? Original goal of creation. Is that what? the trees would taste like fruit, and the fruit would taste like fruit. That was the original plan. Yet Rashi says something amazing. When the trees themselves are created, the Torah says, eitz o sepri. See, the command, Kachash Baruch Hu's command, was eitz pri o sepri, fruit trees which bring forth fruit. That's done to be understood. The fruit tastes like fruit, and the trees taste like fruit. But Rashi says the earth didn't comply, which of course is not literal because the earth doesn't have free will. But the earth didn't comply, so to speak, and the earth produced fruit that tastes like fruit and trees that taste like trees, presumably, right? Trees. So what's, what, what's, what's the pshat? Right? What's, what, what is it that's happening over here? So there's a very simple yisod that the Ramchal and Rav Kook highlight as well, which is that HaKadosh Baruch Hu created an imperfect world perfectly. The world is created with imperfections by design. The Rebono Shal Olam purposely created an incomplete and imperfect world. Now, there are a variety of reasons for that. We're going to discuss one of them tonight. Variety of reasons. But this idea, so here's a Kashmir who's creating the contrast. What's the contrast? What does the perfect world look like? In the perfect world, it's not sweet fruit, bitter trees. In the perfect world, there's sweetness everywhere. The fruits taste wonderful. The trees taste wonderful. Everything is fantastically sweet and magnificent. But a Baruch Hu says, I don't want to create a perfect world. 
I want to create an imperfect world perfectly. I want to, by definition, create something that is imperfect. Ultimately, again, why? Why does that Kaddish Baruch? So again, so from the, from the beginning of the creation, Kaddish Baruch who's saying, I'm creating an imperfect world perfectly. Why? Because what's the mandate of man? The mandate of man is to create the perfection from the imperfection of life. My job is not to perfect things for one simple reason. You can't do it. None of us can perfect anything, right? My job is to perfect the imperfection. Or better stated, my job is to maximize the imperfections of this world. The Ribbon Shalom purposely made an imperfect world. Why? Because he wanted us to learn the lesson of maximizing the imperfections, of make the present moment perfect, no matter how imperfect it may be. And it's an amazing thing. We spend our lives looking for perfection. Spend our lives looking for perfection. We spend our lives looking for perfection in Shiduchim. We spend our lives looking for perfection in children, in relationships, in Parnosa. And then we're so frustrated when we can't find perfection. Of course, you're going to be frustrated if you can't find perfection. Why? Because perfection is not to be had in this world. And that is by design. That's why there is no perfect husband, there is no perfect wife, there is no perfect child, there is no perfect parent, there is no perfect job, there is no perfect situation in life because perfection is not part of the fabric of this world because the whole point of life is to maximize the imperfections. The whole point of life is to take something that's imperfect and let me see you make the best of it, HaKadosh Baruch Hu says to us. I've created a whole world that's imperfect. And all I want you to do is try to make it a little bit better. I want you to bring out the beauty from the imperfections. I want you to maximize the imperfections. I don't need you to perfect the imperfections because you can't. Only I, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, could perfect the imperfections. I just want you to find the beauty in the imperfections. I want you to try to make the imperfections a little bit better. And I want you to try to maximize the imperfect situations of life. And this was the mistake of Moshe Rabbeinu. Moshe Rabbeinu thought that his job was to make a beautiful, perfect bris milah, right? A bris milah for the ages. He thought that was his job. Says, that's not your job. Your job is to do a bris milah to the best of your ability that you can on the side of the road while you're traveling down to Egypt with your wife and your kids, Mr. Redeem, the Jewish people from Egypt. That's your job. That's your job. Not, not, not carving stations and not omelet stations. and not every, that, That's not what I need from you. What I need from you is to show people in the midst of a whole bunch of craziness, right? A whole bunch. And by the way, we haven't even touched on all of the craziness, right? Because there's a whole other dynamic over here, which is the Moshe Tzipora dynamic, which was also a difficult one. We'll get to that in Merit Hashem by Parshas Yisro. And al Moshe, what you need to model for the ages is how you could pull over on the side of the road, circumcise your kid in the midst of all of this craziness, make something beautiful, make something meaningful, make something great in the midst of all the imperfection. Because if you can do that, then you've modeled something absolutely magnificent for future generations. And perhaps that's what David Amelech is teaching us in Tilim as well. Perhaps if we go just circle back in the last two minutes that we have, Perhaps what David HaMelech is saying is like this. Right? So when David HaMelech says, when David HaMelech says, it's interesting. So David HaMelech says, who will have bitachon in you? Who will have a sense of security, a sense of faith, a sense of commitment to you? How do you translate yodei shemecha? Literally, those who know your name. What does it mean to know the name of HaKadosh Baruch Hu? So perhaps to be Yodei Shmecha, to know HaKadosh Baruch Hu means that you know that HaKadosh Baruch Hu created an imperfect world perfectly. Yodei Shmecha are those who recognize that the Rebbe Shalom purposely created an imperfect world. And therefore, again, what David HaMelech is saying is like this. You see, if I have bitachon, in the God who created an imperfect world, then what does that give me the chizuk to do? That gives me the chizuk to go ahead and maximize my imperfect circumstances as well. 
See, if I believe in the Ribono Shel Olam who created an imperfect world perfectly, because the Shparach, we see many of us have imperfect circumstances because often we don't get to choose those circumstances. How can the Shparach who gets to choose his circumstances, yet he still created imperfection by design, by design. The Yiftuchu Becha Yodei Shemecha. HaKadosh Baruch you know, true bitachon, true bitachon, are those who know you and understand you. And to know and understand HaKadosh Baruch Hu means to know a God who created an imperfect world perfectly. And if I believe in that God, it gives me the bitachon, not only in God, but it gives me the bitachon in myself to maximize my imperfect circumstances as well. When I, and then, to take it one step further, when I believe in the God who created an imperfect world perfectly, that's when he becomes my misgav ladach. That's when he becomes my fortress. Because now I begin to realize something amazing. You see, when we suffer setbacks or adversity or what we'll call imperfection, right, what's the reflexive, what's the reflexive reaction to that? What's the reflexive reaction? Some, nothing ever goes wrong for anyone here in this room. Baruch Hashem. Incredible. All right, fine. Stuff goes wrong for me all the time. Right? The reflexive reaction is, what happened? What did I do wrong? So, someone just said this to me. Someone just said this to me today. He said, I was talking to a relative of mine in Eretz Yisrael, and my relative told me that the reason why Eretz Yisrael is shut down is because of the Jews of Golos, because of the Jews of Golos, because we don't love Eretz Yisrael enough. So, wow. Wow, that's, that's, wow, your sister's obviously a very holy person, right? I thought Nebuah was no longer here, but apparently it exists, and your sister, Baruch Hashem. So I, I just said, by the way, I just want to tell you, just, you could also say, maybe HaKadosh Baruch Hu is punishing everyone who's in the tourism sector in the state of Israel, right? And depriving them of Parnassah, right? Maybe that's, but it's amazing how when things go wrong, we automatically associate it with like, oh, what, 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 what did we do? What do and now, by the way, there's an element of that, right? The Gemara says, that when things don't go according to plan, a person is supposed to do a chesh nefesh. person is supposed to introspect. But by the way, you know what often happens is when things go wrong, people introspect. You know what they introspect on? I introspect in you, right? <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm interested in you. And that's not what the Gemara said. The Gemara says when stuff goes wrong, introspect in yourself. Keep your mouth closed when it comes to everyone else because more often than not, we don't know what we're actually talking about, right? But, but at the end of the day, it's amazing that like when we encounter the imperfections, the reflexive reaction is, oh, what did we do wrong? What, what did we do wrong, right? Who's doing something wrong in Klal Yisrael that brought about that, right? That brought about that. And meanwhile, it presupposes that things are supposed to be perfect, and when there's an aberration, someone's doing something wrong. And perhaps it's not, oh, sometimes it's like that. I'm sure sometimes it's like that, but also sometimes the imperfections of the world come out because that's how HaKadosh Baruch created the world. And what he wants from us in those imperfect circumstances is to try to find a way to maximize those circumstances. Not to point fingers as to whose fault it is and not to assign blame because often we don't know HaKadosh Baruch who does things, but to try to figure out, you know, God created an imperfect world perfectly, created imperfect by design. So now I'm faced with imperfect situations if HaKadosh Baruch Hu created the imperfect world perfectly, that means I have within me the ability to maximize my imperfect circumstances as well. That's what David HaMelech was saying. The Yiftuchu B'cha Yod'ei Shemecha. HaKadosh Baruch Hu ultimately bitach, ultimate bitachon comes from those who know you. Those who know you know that you are the God who created an imperfect world perfectly. And why did you do that? Because the entire avoda of man in this world, the entire avoda of Kali Yisrael in this world, is to make the present moment perfect and not to wait for a future perfect moment. Don't wait for the perfect moment. Make the present moment perfect. Don't wait for perfect circumstances because they are not to be had. Maximize what you have in hand. And I'll, I'll just mention this, although I generally don't like to wade into this topic. It's interesting to see even in the world, how often the approach to the pandemic is so skewed because we are looking for a perfect answer. You see, it's an amazing thing. If you remember when the pandemic started, I'm bringing this up now because especially now with the new wave that's coming about, you know, when the pandemic started, if you remember again, 
the whole goal, the whole goal was, may anyone remember from years ago, right? Flatten the curve, decrease hospitalizations, don't let things get overloaded. It was never to stop people from getting sick. That, that in other words, we accepted the fact that people were going to get sick. The goal, the goal was just to go ahead and not overrun the healthcare system. That was the goal. And what's fascinating to me is if you notice how we've moved the goalposts. We moved the goalposts. Now, now the goal is people shouldn't get sick. Now, is it a noble thing that people shouldn't get sick? Is that noble? Of course. Is it possible to prevent people from getting sick? You, you could take measures. Of course you could take measures. But sometimes we have to ask ourselves, is the pursuit of the perfect come at the, coming at the expense of so many other things? And we see this happening in our present world. The pursuit of the perfect solution to a pandemic has created so much collateral damage. Does it mean that we throw caution to the wind? Of course not. That would be reckless and irresponsible. But at the same time, to think that there's a perfect answer that's going to address everything. And if we just shut down this, shut down this, shut down this, shut down this, without recognizing that every single shutdown and every single halt that you bring to society has so many other unintended consequences, is it, it's, it's what Moshe Rabinu did. It's the pursuit of the perfect. And Akhilesh Baruch who says, I don't want you to do the pursuit of the perfect. I want you to try to figure out a good solution within the imperfections of life. You have to accept some measure of imperfection in the fabric of life. Those who pursue perfect will lead a life of frustration and lack of fulfillment. But those who find the courage to accept the imperfection in every area of life, but then dedicate themselves to maximizing the imperfect circumstances, those are the people who thrive. Those are the people who accomplish, and those are the people who self-actualize. And this is the message of David HaMelech. The yiftuchu b'cha yodei shemecha. The goal is to know Hashem. But which Hashem is it important to know? The Hashem who created an imperfect world perfectly. And if I could get to know that God, if I can get to know that God, then I could draw some koach from him, and I could say, wow, Kodesh Baruch Hu, you put me in a really imperfect world with a really imperfect life, with a lot of imperfect circumstances, and it's by design. And my job is to make the best of it. My job is to maximize it. My job is to try to figure out how to make the present moment perfect. And when I do that, what ends up happening with this? Who what ends up happening? Then, as David HaMelech says, HaKadosh Baruch Hu becomes the Yehi Hashem Mizgav Ladach then Hashem becomes my fortress. Because then in those moments of life, when I feel overwhelmed by the dysfunction of my life or by the dysfunction of my circumstances, and I say, what is going on over here? Then suddenly HaKadosh Baruch Hu becomes my fortress because HaKadosh Baruch Hu was one who once again created that imperfect world perfectly and created that design so that I would find the chizuk to find the perfection or to find the good in my imperfect circumstances as well. So it should be Zoha. You know, this was, this was the guiding light of David Amalek and all of David Amalek. So David Amalek had a, David Amalek did not have an idyllic life. He did not have an easy life. He did not have a storybook life by any stretch of the imagination. But what David Amalek did was try to maximize the imperfect circumstances whenever he could. Where did he get this Musa from? He learned it from Moshe Rabbeinu. But ultimately, he learned it from HaKadosh Baruch Hu. He learned that bitachon comes from knowing the God who is the perfect creator who creates imperfectly. That's what gave David HaMelech the ability and the strength to weather his imperfect circumstances. And Amir HaShem should give us the strength to maximize our imperfect circumstances as well. All right, we'll stop over here for tonight. Amir HaShem, next week, I think we're going to jump, actually, because now I think we're actually caught up in the film cycle. So I think next week, we're actually going to... Fast forward to Kapitel Ayin, to Kapitel 70 in Mirz, or 69, I have to check. Until Mirz Hashem, Shkach, everyone.
anything this year to make